Okay. Hello. Hi. Hello. Turned out that there was a lot more of line cleavage in the paint, um, so we had to 
about our game and now we are in a seven step procedure. Of course, there are well, plenty of hours that we, um, that we needed to uh, finish this project. And so we'll have a second phase um, where we'll have two weeks of combined work with the objects lab and all the interns that we can, uh, we can get to really um, spend uh, the time to get these, uh, get the paint secured. Um, and then they will ship uh, to our current offsite storage. Um, it's a bit of a conundrum that we have these things that live in storage and there's no intention of, you know, bringing them out anytime soon. At the same time, our curators are often very reluctant to, um, yeah, the accession things. And this was one of these examples where we um, said, okay, will we use them? Um, can we the accession them? But um, the, the answer was no. And then we have to take care of things, right? So um, an interesting um, subject for the museum as a whole. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's fun to, for us to work on things. Um, this chest here um, was another storage discovery um, of a more pleasant kind. Um, this comes from the collection of Out of the Americas. And if you look a little closer, and I'm sorry you can't all see it very well, but you can uh, easily tell that these two lions have no way have an American background. So um, we recently hired a new curator who is specialized in Latin American furniture and knows much about you know the trade between different continents. And she um, um, said it's a, a, a chest that was probably made for you know um, traveling the world, and it was made in the Philippines. Um, and we brought it up because we know um, not much about it and. Um, she wants to do some research and that allows me to spend some time doing some uh, technical examination as well. And it's a wonderful piece that has this very wonderful piratey um, appearance. It's actually in much better shape inside. Um, but, you know, it's just a great opportunity for us to learn um, about something that we have had in our collection uh, since 1902, actually. So it's, it's one of the really old pieces. Um, This wicker chair um, is a recent acquisition of the Art of the Americas department. Um, there was a very large, um, or, um, let's say, um, active private collector in, uh, in the New York area that amassed uh, a huge collection of wicker furniture. And she had to um, distribute her collection recently. I think she um, you know, probably moved in some sort of assisted living. And so she um, put her collection on the market. And, and it was actually a collection that was already published. And so somebody gave us a tip that these were coming up um, in, a, in a fairly um, small town in the area. And we had kind of a first pick of the objects that we wanted from this collection. Um, you can see that it really um, shows off the uh, highest techniques of uh, Wicca construction. Um, so uh, Massachusetts had a very important industry and actually um, in the United States founded the, uh, a large industry of wicker furniture and that was because a lot of the ships that came um, from Asia with trade had rattan as a ballast material or packing material and so they were looking for a way to repurpose this and came up with you know using it for furniture. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting that up until now we didn't have any examples of wicker furniture um, that, um, you know, it's such a, yeah, it's, it's such a local thing. Um, this uh, Victorian stroller had um, a very fancy original upholstery and I, I just giving you a picture here because the, the panels are currently um, elsewhere. Um, so you can see um, it had two side panels here on the inside and also a back and um, seat panel. And you can see that how fancy it was. It had channeling, it had tufting, it had tassels. So anything you can imagine um, to be you know, on a Victorian upholstery, this uh, really featured this. Um, the condition was rather um, um, bad and it was in such a state that we couldn't display it anymore. Uh, one, one side for aesthetic reasons, but also we wouldn't have been able to clean it uh, because the velvet was just too fragile. Um, so we decided to um, have her productions commissioned. Um, 
And um, yeah, these are in the works right now. Um, and in the post for Prince Herbert, I was based in London, which is an interesting question. I'm going to turn you around because Greg um, is going to tell you a little bit about his work on frames as well. So I'm Greg, I'm the frame conservator. Um, the museum has, I mean, probably much more than this, but we try to catalog, we give all the frames that we're dealing with uh, an FR number so that they can be the length of the object. Uh, we're currently at about 5,000 frames. Um, there's a variety of paintings that have multiple uh, frames, depending on if they need glass when they travel, things like that. So uh, I care for the collection, whether that's dealing with the frame over there is something that actually uh, hasn't really been on view in a while, and it's going to be going in the show uh, in about a month. So that needs to be treated. And then uh, this frame here, actually, we just made. And uh, I got to a water bill, which was fun. I don't always get to do that. Um, Actually, there were two. There was another one that just went up to Rachel's lab yesterday, or actually went downstairs to be put together, uh, which was another frame that I got to make that was water gilded. Um, and this frame right here is uh, an over frame, a travel frame for an icon painting that has a very narrow, uh, probably not original engaged frame. So there was no way to put glass in it, but we need to put glass and seal it when it mm -hmm. travels. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully today we're putting it together. Uh, the engaged frame we're hoping is going to act like the spacer for the glass because we can't take it off. It's nailed onto the panel. So glass will go in, come forward. Hopefully the glass will be nice and far from the face of the panel. Um, but it's kind of fun when we get to create something new because a lot of the time when I'm doing work here, most of what I do, I try to do it in techniques that are uh, detectable and reversible. So a lot of the time if I'm replacing like a uh, cast ornament uh, on a frame or something, or even sometimes like a whole run of a wooden carved element, uh, we use two-part epoxy and dental mold material. Um, this is just a sample from when uh, I made a bunch of replacement uh, chair rails for a period room where we didn't, we had to expand the room to fit in the room when it was re-installed uh, downstairs. Um, and we didn't wanna basically pay somebody to carve, you know, 20 feet of, of this. So, um, but the nice part is, is a lot of the time we use a acrylic method of gilding. If it's something that needs to, like on a frame like that, fit in, you want it to blend, but you also want to be able to reverse it in the future. Um, I definitely know from my job, a lot of my job is down the road, being like, why did they do this? And you're like, <laughs> I guess in 1980 it was a really good idea. So I'm guessing in 20 years they're going to be like, why did they do that? Um, so most things that I do, I try to do uh, reversible. It's nice when you're doing something new and you can actually do a traditional uh, sort of technique um, which, once again, does not happen all the time. Um, but the collection, like I said, there's 5,000 frames. We have a really, really robust uh, lending program, as well as things coming into the museum. So there's like a constant condition checking, uh, making sure things are ready to travel, making sure things can hold glass. Um, like I was saying before, making sure things are in the correct frame. Um, there are certain collections, like the Copley collection, where we have a lot of portraits. They're in, they're all the same size, but we only have certain frames that can hold glass. So everything is sort of linked together in our database, but there's certain frames that they get swapped um, so that they can hold glass and be able to travel. So, um, yeah. And as opposed to a lot of other departments, like Rachel, who's in paintings, will also be in the same boat. Uh, some departments, things uh, have a sort of slower turnover. Frames, constant all the time. Um, we have shows that'll. We have a show uh, in the spring next year that has uh, 100 uh, paintings in it. Oh. So, you know, even though that show, some version of that show had gone up previously a few years ago, all of those need to be reassessed, some need to be treated. So it's just a constant, um, you know, Jobs. movement of things. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's just <laughs> constantly. So um, even though it's been busy, it's fun. Kind of, I actually get to make things. And, yeah, yeah awesome. not always just check out things. There's so, yeah. a wood show. Uh, so we have uh, an actual carpenter shop downstairs uh, where our preparators are in the basement. They have like a real basic, you know, chop saw type wood shop. And then um, you guys are going to see Brett and Kim's space. We just saw it. Oh, you just saw it. Did you go all the way to the back? No. Uh, there's a little, there's a little like small shop back there that has like a really nice uh, table saw planer, chop saw. You know, they obviously have tools too. It's a small space. So as soon as you start getting into something that has a lot of dimension, you can't really you know, if you, you, you'll hit a window or something. Yeah, so you, but we do have, we have multiple versions, but yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's my space. 
<laughs> so uh, enjoy. I'm not sure where you guys are going next. We are going upstairs. Cool. So thank you, Greg. Thank you, thank you guys yeah, so much. Enjoy the tours. Thank you. Oh, okay. I was the I was the senior three